Queria perguntar se o Marco do lado, sem aparecer, conseguia depois clicar para partilhar o ecrã e essas coisas. Hi, Professor João. <laughs> Hi. Uh, we are about to start the last um, opening session for day three of the meeting. And welcome, Professor Paula Guerra. Uh, oh. <laughs> how are you all? Uh, Fine. Ready for an ready. amazing talk between engineering and sociology? Let's go. Okay, I'm going to take this uh, just for introduction and uh, uh, welcome everyone who are watching us live in YouTube. This is day three and the last day of the second international meeting of What If World History, um, an event that is part of the days of alternative history, wine, punk and friends, hosted by Casa Comum uh, at the Rectorate of the University of Porto. And um, being this the last day, I wanted, before introducing our guests for the face-to-face -face invited lectures session, um, to make a little bit of a summary of uh, what went on on the event and um, what to expect uh, of the following afternoon of the sessions, okay? So I'm going to uh, share. Okay. Um, so I start by acknowledging once again um, the Dean of uh, the University of Porto, Professor Antonio Sousa Pereira, and the Vice Dean for Culture, Professor Fatima Vieira, for being uh, so amazing at accepting such an unusual meeting and um, cultural events as we made throughout the week. And uh, Dr. Marco Gabriel, without technical help and support would be impossible to do this. Um, we had on day one, a series of round tables uh, with um, subjects and teams such as, for example, using alternative history and crossing it with history of science to predict um, alternative scenarios that would help policymakers to prevent and correct problems such as climate um, changes and uh, pand the pandemics like the one that we are unfortunate going through and stop us from being face to face truly uh, during this event. Um, he crossed ideas with the Professor Maria Minerva Kalimag from the Philippines that explored through alternative stories what would have, ha would have happened to the history of medicine and anesthesiology if instead of taking the road that was taken by Morton, he would have understand the importance of developing anesthesiology through the, um, the perspective of the patient. patient. Um, to be more focused on the um, eliminating patient suffering and not just um, making it dormant for the procedure. Uh, on the second round table, we had um, um, an approach to what could have happened to today's uh, scenario of STEM um, for women and girls around the world if we had better knowledge of the role that many women uh, had uh, during, for example, the development of the World Wide Web. How would that affect if more uh, of the role of many women in tech would be known uh, instead of being a bit amiss in the official uh, chronicles? And it was contrasted with the work of Professor Cristina Garigos from Spain uh, I forgot the name of um, the two previous. We had for the modeling uh, past uh, through history science, Professor José Ferraz Caetano, 
And for women and men in technology, uh, we had Professor Renata Frad. And Professor Christina explored how music and the world, because the world is made of music, would be different if punk women had not existed. Yesterday, we had um, round tables that explored how would our world change if the Monty Python had preferred different techniques to use in their sketches. And this was delivered by Andrea Leite Coelho from the University of Vigo. And uh, he had a talk with uh, Cynthia Montadon Tomas from Mexico that uh, explored how um, using alternative stories you can build a consensus among people that would promote change because as she put it and very well, uh, we don't like change usually. And to change in a way that is effective and perennial, we need to have um, different approaches to the ones that are currently being used and alternative stories and histories could be a valuable tool on such a, an endeavor. On the fourth round table, we had um, a theme that is very close to my heart because nowadays we are facing a, a grave danger in uh, academic publications. I saw a couple of days in, um, in Twitter, an academic that uh, with a bit of sense of humor said, one day I'll have to mortgage my house to be able to publish because um, the policy of publishing and being and having to pay to publish research is uh, mining a bit of what is happening on the uh, scientific re research around the world. And uh, Samuel Etienne from Paris had an interesting proposal on how we can address this issue and explore it and presented also um, a new academic journal that he founded and uh, that can be a, a solution proposal in a practical manner for this type of problem. And on the other side of the round table, we had Ondina Pires and Ana Oliveira from Portugal. And um, music was again on the table, which is uh, very well suited as the, the main theme of this meeting year, of the, the meeting of this year was art and alternative music. Uh, um, I am really sorry, this is how tired I am. It was art and alternative history. And um, we had music as art form very present on the right tables. And we had an artist as well, because Ondina Pires um, was one of um, the first uh, women in alternative music, namely on drums. I think it's how you say it. Um, in Portugal, and uh, through her um, case study and lens, we are able to explore the, um, the possibilities and non possibilities of artistic careers in Portugal, and how uh, alternative history scenarios could explore different uh, outcomes for what are present problems. We had also a different type of um, conversations. We had the invited lectures face-to-face -face sessions. This is the first one where we had Professor Paulo Almeida from the Faculty of Fine Arts of the University of Porto, and as well from the University of Porto, Professor Pedro Campos from the Faculty of Ec Economy. So we had a face-to-face -face between economics and arts, which um, they enjoy it, I enjoy it, everyone enjoy it because it was really, really interesting and full of new ideas. And yesterday we had another encounter, this time sadly it had to be fully in Zoom, um, between a professor of Feo Bertolami from the Faculty of Science of University of Porto and Professor João Carlos Correia from the University of Beira Interior. And it was a face-to-face -face between physics and communication sciences. And again, it was very enjoyable. It was filled with great ideas that I hope don't stop by the end of the meeting and we'll continue. And today we'll have another face-to-face -face, uh, between Professor João Ventura from Technic of Lisboa and uh, uh, he's representing engineering and Professor Paula Guerra from the Faculty of Arts and Letters of the University of Porto representing sociology. And uh, we'll have afterwards 
uh, the last round table that we'll have again Cynthia Montano Tomas exploring how alternative stories and alternative history can be an asset in scenario planning. And on the other um, side of the table will be Doris Diaz and uh, Professor Jose Ferraz Caetano exploring how gaming and history of science can. And, um, be an excellent approach for uh, science communication storytelling. And um, we end with gaming because I can now announce that uh, the main theme and subject for next year meeting will be gamification and alternative history. And um, why all these round tables and invited lectures face to face instead of the usual oral presentations uh, or invited lectures that are usually monologues? because we value uh, above all the building and crossing between uh, different and even eventual opposing fields and that can only be made through conversation. It's harder to explore ideas and your research work to talking with each other, but um, it uh, is more creative. <laughs> and this is a very creative meeting. And it's more interesting for those watching and for those participating. We also said on day one, uh, value alternative history as the embodiment of um, what we consider and believe to be two essential uh, analytical tools that are not used as often as they should be in um, academic and scientific research, which, is, which are comedy and absurd. Because um, research is human and you cannot be human without these two tools. And now we, I will stop talking. I already introduced our um, uh, two guests for the invited lecture face-to-face -face session of today. And uh, I will leave for you to talk and to delight us as I am sure you will. Okay. The floor is yours, Professor Paula and Professor Joel. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. And, uh, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, this initiative. I think it's very interesting. Um, as I can see in the other days, it's incredible uh, the, the, this exchange between the sciences and between arts and science. And I think it's very interesting. And I'm very grateful to be part of this. Um, and then I want to say thank you to João to, <laughs> to be part with me with this challenge to the, and this discussion between sociology and engineering. But uh, I think it's more between uh, um, fanzines and, uh, and something like uh, scientific fiction. But let's see. Uh, I start and after João uh, proceed. Yes. Yes, John. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I go. Uh, I go put um, share a, um, a presentation. Um, uh, uh, this presentation uh, is about uh, fanzines, uh, namely punk fanzines. Um, Fast, Furious and Xerox, Fanzine's production within Portuguese punk scenes it, and its evolution in terms of ideology and aesthetics in the last 14 years. Um, and this, this happens because we have me and a colleague uh, named Pedro Quintela, we have this book, this recent book about fanzines, not only about Portuguese fanzines, but uh, about uh, fanzines around the world uh, 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 in terms of music, but not only music, uh, fe femini feminist fanzines, etc. Um, is is a, a, a emblematic image because it's uh, a fanzine from the 80s, uh, from Porto, namely Espinho, the name is Cadáver Esquisito. Um, and what, what, what you can say? 
First, fanzines arise in decades of 20 and 30s associated with science fiction fans. However, the production, distributions, and consumption of fanzines won global relevance with the emergence of punk phenomenon in the UK and USA during the 70s and 80s. Uh, and also uh, we can see here Sniff and Glue and most important fanzines from UK. Atten has contested the idea that fanzine is assumed to essentially a subcultural product emancipating the fanzine culture through a symbolic agreement between the fanzine and the experience and lifestyle. From the perspective of Acton, the fanzine emerged from three, three main reasons. The fanzine operates as a space of a, for expression and discussion by fans of a musical genre, bands or artists who, who do not have space or are forgotten by traditional music press. The fanzine serves to strengthen an, under, an underground musical gender, bands or artists whose range is very limited. And for at least, the fanzine allows the fans are of a musical dish to keep up the connection and enthusiasm. In all these cases, the objective is to create community of interest and taste. And obviously, this is not confined to the punk. Fanzines like Tastics adopt a do it yourself independent approach that punk musicians has, uh, uh, had exposed. With the rise of newly formed bands, can the establishment of impromptu to clubs, small independent record labels, and record stores. In the same way, fanzines offer fans a free space for developing ideas and practices, and a visual space and recovered by formal design rules and visual expectations. Usually homemade, produced with a limited circulation, the fanzines tend to be written and published by, by punk movement members individually or collectively, having uh, as their target audience in their peers, other punk fans. As, Juni, as Julia Pine refers, fanzines are a material forms of representation. This collective and volunteer constructed addicting, addicting contributions and distribution objects allow an individual to state their social existence and cultural participation. At the same time, they material, that materialize a local movement. As an, uh, in other dimensions of punk movement, fanzine graphic components play an equal or even a more important role than the written tests. In fact, very often happens that writing and visual components are so deeply mixed that it becomes impossible to develop a separate analysis of these two elements. The pioneer English punk fanzines of the second half of the 70s, such as Panache, Sniff Clue, Rip and Torm, and Tom gave a specific contribution to the creation of a specific aesthetic and editorial language that turned out to be a sort of subcultural canon. In recent decades, this graphic language of resistance was in the speed and globalized, leading to the reproduction of a do-it-yourself ethic and a certain way of doing punk fanzines that still persist until to, uh, today. As the comb showed, tools and personal ethics occupy a central place in this type of self-edited independent publications. The page of fanzines often reflect the ideology of their authors by their sociopolitical position on, on or the support of, for certain causes. We also see vis visible demonstrations of a particular taste or aesthetics, for example, in interviews with bands or in certain critical reviews or records and demo tapes, con concerts, movies, books, or even other fanzines. Finally, in some fanzines, we find articles with very personal contents, sometimes even of an extra introspective and intimate nature. The fanzines are, in short, very, for us, very rich communication formats in which we find extensive information that allows us to understand a little better how, in each, each historical moment and each specific sociocultural and territorial context, the punk movement was developing and, uh, for us, is a way to, uh, to show and count another story, an alternative story. 
Now I pass to uh, Professor Ventura. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm going to share the... Just um, trying to share the mm, my mm, uh, uh, um, so uh, in in the end of the there are uh, uh, like a chat participants yeah, yeah okay, okay chat and share the I can't see the share. Uh, João, hmm? it's the green button. Uh, you see it immediately because it's the only one of that color in the many buttons at the green bottom. button. You click in it, you upload the presentation you want, and then you put in full. Um, a full uh, uh, display mode. mode. Um, uh, I have an idea, uh, and uh, maybe mm -hmm. prof uh, Professor Juan can send to you, and you okay. can share. No. Uh, <clears throat> ah, okay. I've seen it. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So after this <clears throat> small, I think the each time the technology becomes more complicated. <clears throat> I'm, I'm too old already to, to learn all these things. Uh, okay, let's start. So I'm talking, I'm, I, I will basically be talking a bit about uh, fanzines in the field of uh, speculative fiction, uh, mainly science fiction, but uh, not exclusively. And um, this is the first one I'll, uh, in some of these fanzines, uh, I, I've, I've, uh, I have collaborated, but uh, I usually know the, the, the editors of these uh, fanzines. This was an effort, these two uh, examples of Dragão Quantico, uh, the editor was Rogério Ribeiro, and this, um, it was, this fanzines constitutes a, a first uh, way of publish, publishing uh, on paper um, for authors that uh, had no access to the normal uh, publishing houses. <clears throat> Usually, due to the limitations in size and in reproduction, 
uh, it was um, only uh, stories, short stories, let's say, could be published in this medium. Uh, but it was important because many people saw their first stories published uh, in, uh, in fanzines. Hyperdrive Zine, uh, the, the editor was Ricardo Loureiro, and uh, also some, a few numbers <coughs> have been published in the years beginning of the, of the 21st century. So 2003, 2004, 2005. Um, usually <clears throat> they were um, publications, uh, short-lived public publications. Uh, that means in most of the cases we find uh, people were able to publish three, four, uh, five copies, but then it stopped because either they uh, got fed up with the business or they, uh, they got other things that they were more interested in and uh, the, the, fund, uh, the funds in disappeared. <laughs> this is another example. It was called Fantastis. The editors were Telmo Pinto and uh, Tiago Gama and also mainly short stories, sometimes very, uh, very short stories. <clears throat> Phoenix was another fanzine that had several editions. The, the editors of this uh, Phoenix were Alvaro Stein and uh, Marcelina uh, Leandro, <coughs> based in Oporto, and they they did uh, a lot of work trying to um, assemble different people that were already publishing. Um, I would say that in parallel with these fanzines, which were publications in paper. Uh, <coughs> This was a time where there were also several uh, sites on the web <laughs> where people uh, publish uh, short fiction. Sometimes these editors, uh, they, they, they filled both positions. That is, they, they edited uh, fanzines in paper and also they, they animated these sites where people could publish online. <laughs> the Phoenix that I just told you about, uh, at some stage, the, the aim was a bit wider. And in this case, you see an anthology of short stories, which is a bit uh, bigger than uh, the normal fanzine, where uh, large amount of authors were assembled in this uh, uh, Phoenix anthology. Another publication, Trema. Trema um, was edited by Rogério Ribeiro and it was born out of a workshop on creative fiction, which was carried out and the Biblioteca Orlando Ribeiro in Lisbon. So as the <clears throat> outcome of this, um, of this workshop, Rogério Ribeiro edited this uh, magazine uh, called Trema with several contributing authors. Nanozine uh, or Nanozine <coughs> was also, uh, we could call it a fanzine, but the, uh, in this case, there was uh, some continuity because the, the, the copy you are, you are seeing, it was already number nine. And uh, again, it, this was a publication uh, dedicated to uh, 
short or very short stories. Another example, Lusitania, was the, the editor was Carlos Silva, in uh, based in Lisbon. He is also he is now the the person who is uh, in the front of, of uh, an editor, uh, an ed 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 editorial, uh, Imagine Alta, which uh, dedicates uh, itself to publishing publishing in the <coughs> field of speculative fiction. <laughs> so these were two numbers of this uh, fanzine called Lusitania, <laughs> which was the the main idea was to publish stories based on the uh, Portuguese uh, uh, fantastic. So <laughs> going to local stories and trying to build fiction upon that. OK, uh, I think I would, uh, Paula, I would stop here. I have some. A, a few more, but then uh, we'll uh, sort of uh, uh, alternate between uh, between mm -hmm. the two of us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you can. Uh, okay, you can uh, uh, not share the, your your um, your. Uh, okay. So, uh, so uh, the uh, our introduction, uh, what we say a uh, few minutes ago, and these these materials that uh, Professor Joan can bring to to show to show us. Uh, uh, demonstrate the importance of, of fanzines and other type of publications, uh, this type of publications, counting another story or counting other stories of a country, of a region, of a group of persons, of, indeed, of a community of people. So we do this work about the Portuguese punk fanzines. Um, and we, made, we, we made an, an exercise um, this is some numbers of the, 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 our sample. Uh, and, uh, as you can see, uh, in, term, in between 78 and 2013, uh, we have uh, a map of our country and we can see the, the production of fanzines uh, have uh, 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 the same distribution as other cultural uh, manifestations and other artistic manifestations. Even uh, we speak about underground production, in fact, uh, the cities and the littoral of the country are uh, most uh, profico uh, uh, forms of do, uh, the artistic manifestations. Uh, the first punk fanzine is that one, uh, Total Disorder, Disorder in Total, uh, arise in Portugal in the late 70s in the Lisbon area, in, uh, is, is the case of this order, this, uh, Total Disorder. Fanzine with six numbers, published uh, between 78 and 79, and start the situ, uh, fanzine ed edited, by, edited by Paulo Bosch, also a member of a band Mina, Minas and, and Irmadilhas, a pioneer band punk in Portugal, which published at least six numbers to the 78. Do it yourself aesthetic orientation. Uh, we is also the first publications in terms of fanzine in Portugal. Uh, uh, based on a blend of a cut and paste techniques, drawing illustration and write and type of, type of tests, photo manipulation, etc. We found these early fanzines essentially a space 
um, for a sarcastic comment about national and international sociopolitical reality. The reference to Anglo-Saxon punk bands are also frequent. Many true pictures of bands elements uh, not always identified. Uh, in the 80s, uh, the first boom of punk fazines in Portugal, we have uh, a image of the, uh, the Condenação Pacific, uh, Pacific condition, condemnation, following the development of punk scenes in Portugal, witnessed during the 80s, a certain proliferation of fanzines, although uh, at this stage still largely uh, concentrated in metropolitan areas of Lisbon and Porto. Uh, out of the political uh, and social criticism is still crucial, the musical di dimension gains a clear relevance from this period. So fanzines become a fundamental space for dissemination of punk bands, or in not only punk, but alternative rock punk bands, both national and international. Articles on punk and hardcore bands that in these years breaks out in Portugal and also reports on some punk international scenes like Australia, USA, Brazil, Italy become frequent in these fanzines. And we have another example, um, Aviso Final, 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 final uh, advice or something like that. Uh, initially, these publishers were using essentially secondary sources, such as newspaper articles, press releases, but gradually they began to incorporate primary, primary data in general by conducting interviews with bank bands, both national and international. Um, from a graphic point of view, the Portuguese punk fanzines or alternative punk fanzines produced during the 80s reflect a certain maturity of the producers. Formally, we found that in many cases there is more, a more careful presentation, but many fanzines from this period still maintain essentially do-it-yourself approach that since the beginning always characterized the punk culture. Uh, in the 90s, proliferation, distortion, and diversification. Uh, we, uh, e e e example, witness diversification of punk subgenres addressed in fanzines, which is reflected in the increasing relevance of crust and straight edge hardcore, for, for example, but also a great openness to other underground aesthetics, not only musical genres such as hip hop reggae dub, or even certain subgenres of electronic music, but also other issues are addressed here, such for, for, such for instance, skateboarding, and not, not, not only skateboarding. New topics gain relevance in fanzines during the 90s, ethical and policy issues related to anarchist libertarian ideologies, Human rights, vegetarianism, veganism, animal rights, sexism, homophobia, drug use, among others. And we have here, for instance, uh, uh, a manifestation about Fatima, about the uh, religion and contestation about uh, the religion. The advent of the personal computer in Portugal that during the 19th will become increasingly important, become remarkable from the graphic point of view. So many of the fanzines published during this period show a greater technical position, moving away from a certain cut and paste aesthetic purism that mark the early stage of bank in Portugal and abroad. In this period, his word managed the fanzines as mutant Grito de Revolta, Crackzine, Vontade de Ferro, Atitude Alternativa, Animal Abuser, Golpe Baixo, Global Riot, Insubmission, Cannabisine, First Step, Out of Step, Hope, Bacuzine, Se o Voto é uma Arma, uh, Se o Voto é a Arma do Povo, Zona Autónoma Provisória, Convicção, Conviction, Rebeldia, and Spirit of Youth, for instance. 
what another interesting point is the mix between uh, English and Portuguese and uh, progressively the importance of the designation of the fanzines in English it is also important to uh, connect that with the advance of society and education in Portugal. Uh, the new the, the 2000s and the new millennium refinement and deepening over the last 30 years the production distribution and consumption of bank fanzines seems to not have slowed um, among other fanzines edited during this period we may refer to the following ones inumanos sanbao sisterly rastilho vontade de ferro opinion wake up and live Two Sides, Osso da Pilinha, Suburbano, Ação Direta, Excat, Crise Social, Mozinha de Cabeceira, uh, Porque Nada Se Constrói, Sozinho, Backfire, Grita, Comedores de Cadáveres, Nós Chatwords, A Culpa é da Humanidade, Alambico, Alfinete, Caos Urbano, A, a Pupa ao Papa, Nuca Duro, Juice, O Prego, Mundo Brutal, Jubilados, City Lights, Amble, Skate Zine, Over, Overpower, Overcome, De Flagra e Carapaça, etc. Although the beginnings of the 2000s is definitely marked by the emergence of several online forums, web blogs and e-zines related with punk scenes, we, which use the power of internet for a, a quick, easy and expressive dissemination of punk bands, records, concerts, festivals, the truth is that traditional fanzines published on paper and distributed on underground circuits continue to show a strong resilience. And uh, after we, uh, I give a word to João, and after we can uh, discuss about that resilience today and what type of fanzines we have today. Um. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, portanto, tinha, tinha, tinha vos falado na. Oh, sorry. Uh, I had uh, mentioned the uh, fanzine Lusitania, and now I'll, uh, I'll speak a bit about uh, a certain type of fanzine that has been, it started in. <coughs> Uh, 2012, and it's called Almanac Steampunk. Uh, steampunk is a, a, a kind of uh, subfield within the speculative fiction that is, uh, it covers uh, uh, stories uh, in the environment of the Victorian times. Uh, where this, the steam is the, the, the main uh, driving power. Um, and uh, Almanac is a kind of publication which was very common in the end of 19th century, beginning of 20th century, which was a publication that people would buy and could be uh, read along the year because it had uh, different uh, kinds of information, um, fiction sometimes, uh, stories, uh, puzzles, uh, indications about the weather, about the way of growing vegetables, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> so this uh, Almanac Steampunk uh, recovers that uh, that sort, that type of publication, but in the 
in the environment of the of the um, steampunk uh, uh, topos. Uh, that means uh, all this. It, it has short stories. It has uh, uh, adverts. It uh, it has the horoscopes. Uh, anything that you could find in a normal uh, almanac is is in this uh, almanac steampunk. <laughs> Here you see two editions uh, from uh, 2012 and 2013. <laughs> Here uh, initially the um, coming back, <laughs> Clockwork Portugal was a collective uh, in based in Oporto. Uh, where that were responsible for the two first editions. <laughs> then Court de North again, a collective in Oporto, which published the uh, 2015 edition. <laughs> and then in 2017, it was already published in Lisbon. And the last edition, <coughs> Pardon. The last edition from 2019 <coughs> was published by <coughs> Editorial Divergencia, uh, a small publishing house in Lisbon <coughs> um, that uh, publishes uh, speculative fiction. And, uh, and uh, it, it has published uh, several books in this last uh, this last years. <coughs> the the steampunk is probably one is one of the uh, subfields in speculative fiction, which is more related to alternative story, alternative history. In the sense that when we uh, when we put some uh, uh, the action of a story in the Victorian times, we are in fact establishing uh, different timelines uh, based or starting in that in, in that time, <clears throat> and so the the main concept of alternative history is in fact. Um, in the essence of this uh, steampunk uh, subgen, um, one imp one thing that I think is important on reading this type of fiction <laughs> is that the pleasure that one takes from that reading. Uh, increases if the reader has got uh, knowledge about the history of that period, because it's the, uh, during the, 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 the reading act, what we are, we are reading the fiction, and at the same time, uh, it is present in our head, the, the the real, between commas or not, the real history. <laughs> and that means it's a kind of uh, shift that our brain has to make between what we are reading and what uh, was supposed to have happened in reality. And this is uh, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, thing and, and it's very pleasurable. <laughs> um, Paula, would you like to take? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, because it's interesting because um, apparently uh, there are no connection between uh, this type of fanzines and steampunk uh, uh, material that you bring. But uh, I realize uh, that uh, there are maybe there are, there are a little connection between punk and this type of literature, this type of fantastic. Because punk starts to be something um, uh, lower in society, something with no name, so something, uh, uh, something uh, really underground, like a subproletariat of Marx, 
something like that. The, the first definition of punk is something like this underground, this type of thing. And I, I, I meet some parallels between this punk or these expressions and the steampunk uh, uh, expressions that you speak about. Another, another interesting point is, as, as these type of fanzines, you, you, the type of publication that you bring to us uh, is a type of publications that uh, uh, show us different things. So uh, some kind of new worlds or other worlds, other, other realities that uh, are not mainstream reality, the mainstream identity. And this is very important and a very connection between. Uh, between. And as I said to you yesterday, uh, and uh, is interesting because nowadays with internet, with everything that you, we have, uh, th these worlds of technology that we have, the fanzine don't not that uh, uh, the fanzine not don't don't not die. Uh, the fanzine um, uh, have, a, have a, a sort of reappropriation re in these times. For instance, Samuel. Uh, my colleague, my French colleague, we have the Journal of Zines. Um, for, we have in this moment a, a special call about feminism and fanzines, uh, for instance. Um, and uh, we have special issues about dif different thematics and that proves uh, that are a, a um, the importance of these types of communication, these 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 alternative ways uh, of publications to communicate and aggregate people, and I want to 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 share with with uh, with um, with uh, with uh, with you and the others uh, also something. Um, <clears throat> let me. If you speak about the, we made a, um, we made a, um, a content analysis. Uh, okay, uh, uh, we made a content analysis of fanzines, uh, of these fanzines, and uh, affinity and musical sociability had the largest numbers of occurrences, most in the importance of music, information, and operation of a particular punk scene through the following seven items. The reference of bands, defense, defense of Portuguese punk music scenes, disclosure of fanzines, radio, and concert spaces, the apology of punk hardcore Portuguese skinhead scenes, the disclosure of records, labels, and distributors, the criticism of punk hardcore Portuguese scenes and the criticism of concerts, records, and books. In contrast to the titles of fanzines, in their contents, we can observe a focus on music and its daily celebrations and proclamation as element of Portuguese punk scene. And after musical affinity and sociability, celebration and hedonism are the most commonly recurring the the thematics in sections and pages of Portuguese punk fanzines. This conclusion is based on the evaluation of a group identity or musical community in the linking of affections and pleasures. Fanzines normally develop around the establishment of social relations, that is, among operators in local scenes with emotions based on commit commitment or assimilation in relation to shared, shared values. Uh, the first book of the thematics present in the content of the fanzines that were analyzed or relates to the defense of an alternative to the system of criticized behaviors, social criticism and revolt, precisely uh, to thematics that relate back to the values and ideals exposed in terms of the titles. We have here the position uh, of the res resistance that is abundantly attributed to the punks, but in context of this inclusion in the local punk scenes and sub Scenes. And maybe uh, in, uh, in, your, in your publications, Juan, mm -hmm. in your publications, we can find this type of position, other 
similar position like that, like these people. What do you think? Well, um, the the fanzines as they as they appear in the in the science fiction field they appear as something alternative to the to the main publishing uh, ways <coughs> uh, essentially when they appear because it was very difficult in portugal we had we had for for a certain number of years uh, a few collections of uh, science fiction and fantasy uh, the best known is Coleção Argonauta, the Livros do Brasil, but then it it stopped publishing. <laughs> there were a few other uh, publishing houses that started collections of science fiction, but some of them stopped. And anyway, it was difficult to publish uh, books. So th this was a, a way people uh, found to have things in print. <laughs> uh, in fact, I tend to think that nowadays um, the, the, the online is an alternative to fanzines. It's a parallel way. Uh, it doesn't sub substitute, but it's a way uh, easier because it doesn't depend. Uh, <laughs> electrons are cheap. Uh, and uh, if you publish online, you can you you can print if you if you like it. You can just download and print. So it's a way of of spreading the way of making things known. Uh, mm -hmm. I tend to think. Mm -hmm. Make things happen. Yes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's, it's totally true. Also here in the, the, this type of fanzines, more related with music, but they, they are more than music um, because there are a lot of, as, I, as I, we discussed yesterday, uh, there are a lot of fanzines today in format of e-zines and also, for instance, podcasts as fanzines. So the the internet opens all the the possibilities for the existence of the, the zines. Today, the people tend to to speak not uh, not fanzines but about zines. Um, uh, and I I believe that uh, actually the fanzine corresponds to the creation of a community of interest always and taste and it's it is assumed to be a short of low tech social networking and is not confined just to punk the fanzines are material forms of symbolic representations and that is how when we understand the portuguese punk fanzines the object of our attention here our approach was focused on the analysis of fanzines within the concept of punk scenes, explaining them with, within a specific societal framework. This is the main implication of map, mapping decade of pans, Portuguese punk fanzines. Practice and their uh, interrelationships are part of the space and linked and linked link it, it with all the other social process which is with with this mapping of portuguese fanzines well, uh, has allowed us to observe in fanzines language conveys a message of resistance as these fanzines are represented as a places of opposition to mainstream cultural political and social Tal order. The fanzines are spaces of cultural action and political opposition since their titles evoke a critical view of society and anti system positioning. 
This action is taken by the use of linguist terms that point to self-determination, derision, and social contamination. In a complementary way, in contents of fanzines, we see a focus on music in, day, in daily, daily celebration and proclamation of as element of Portuguese punk scene, the themes of musical affinity and sociability appeared with high number of occurrence, demonstrating the importance of music, information and operation of a scene with bands, fanzines, radio and, and concert spaces, and with records, labels and distributors, even if we have internet. Um, <clears throat> the fanzines are erected as symbols of intrinsic meanings, of a given scene, defining values, language, and beliefs of social groups. Fanzines allow the existence of a contrahegemonic communication that resists commodification. Fanzines for their creators are seen as a creation that allows them to be part of something with, uh, with which they share a common basis of understanding, spirit, and with yourself attitude. That is a sense, a sense of belonging to a community and the pluralistic punk scenes. And uh, um, uh, as I can see in your words, Ram, I can see it, it is, is, there are a lot of parallels between the type of publications and this publication that you speak about. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Uh, yeah, there are, there are uh, obviously some, some, uh, <coughs> some parallels. Um, I'm uh, apparently we have some we have questions in the chat and uh, uh, what if the advent of personal computers in Portugal was, was 10 years later hmm what would have changed, namely statically in fanzines, and would that affect the speculative fiction fanzines as well? Mm. <laughs> you want to answer first? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> well, I don't. I don't know if. Uh, when the per when personal computers appeared, the the software that we, that we have nowadays to publish and to uh, add graphics and things like that to to make pretty things on the computer. Uh, it was not immediately after the, comp the personal computer appeared. Personal computer, when it appeared, it came with word processing and spreadsheet and uh, eventually a, a kind of first initial thing like PowerPoint, but it was, it was uh, relatively crude. <clears throat> so it took some time to, to <clears throat> to develop. So uh, probably, I don't know if, uh, if that would uh, affect because the, in the fanzines, people did uh, a lot of things uh, uh, by hand before the computers were, were available. <clears throat> and uh, so I, I really don't know. Um, Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, so 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 I, I with respect to the first question, I, I I don't know if that if the if there would be any any uh, effect. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I also replied to the first question. Um, I I'm not uh, with our collection of fanzines. It's not possible to see these 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 ten years of later, uh, because uh, 
uh, it's not possible to see the differences between the, bank the, the Portuguese fanzines and the others uh, related with the, uh, the, 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 the gap of 10 years uh, later. It's, I, I think it's not possible to see. We have uh, the fanzines we, uh, in terms of objects and we analyze uh, and uh, it's not clear this evidence. I think João uh, re replied to that uh, in the first moment. Uh, it's not uh, clear the, the, the use of these uh, important or sophisticated advi uh, advices in terms of design. And uh, other question, I think the, 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 the personal computers uh, they 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 come to Portugal uh, with with uh, with a delay, of course, but for the major part of the population, not for uh, some some people. There are some people uh, belong to some elite, cultural and artistic elite that uh, they have access to the computer, personal computer, at the same time that and that uh, as the others. So I think it's not a, a relevance, a difference between uh, our fanzines and the others in these terms. The most important difference are in terms of thematics, um, as you can, uh, as you have seen in the in the in the in the in the images, for instance, political affairs and things like that. João, the second question. Why do you think steampunk is so popular? Punk was never picked up by the punk fanzines. Well, I really don't know. We, one has to, to ask that question to the people who publish punk fanzines. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think um, uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, because this this a point to the to the, um, the usual demarcations in terms of uh, legitimate and illegitimate forms of expression and artistic expression and cultural expressions in our country, our country uh, have a, a poor uh, cultural industry and have. Uh, uh, a poor uh, field of produ cultural production and very hierarchical uh, cultural production and artistic production. And I think the, there are no connections between steampunk and the others and the, the others' fanzines because they don't live in the same world. Uh, because it, it, it's a, a question of distinction. It's a question of symbolic distinction. Uh, I think that. Hi. Anna? Yes. Hello. This time the final question will be uh, by life, by me. Um, the steampunk universe is usually a very conservative universe as it is based in Victorian um, times and uh, customs. And um, I always wondered why Though the, the aesthetics of those alternative um, worlds based on steampunk usually are very creative, but, and I, I can be mistaken, of course, but the music sticks much to the Victorian age. And I was wondering what you would think would be if uh, someone put or developed punk music from the Victorian type themed of a steampunk universe. Would it work? Would it be interesting? Uh, it's for both the question. <laughs> João, first. Yeah, you mean developing music? Yes. Uh, punk music uh, with the. Uh... To apply. Yes, because um, either in books or uh, in cinema or, or even television when you have uh, stories based on the steampunk universe, uh, you, you see that the aesthetics, uh, though, though grounded on the Victorian aesthetics, um, evolves for something a little bit different by crossing obviously what we know now, what um, the future uh, for them, 
um, artistic uh, trends. Uh, and do you usually the people uh, who work on this, those types of universe incorporate the, the elements of art that were later on uh, on that universe. However, as far as I know, and again, I say I may be uh, mistaken or wrong, uh, I don't have that same idea regarding music. Mm -hmm. They stick to the Victorian type of music. They don't mix it with other, though it is uh, a universe that is punk. It's uh, underground. It's, um, it's of um, opposition uh, against the establishment. It's not by, by any chance mm -hmm. that many of the characters mm -hmm. of the mm -hmm. Simpunk universe are empowered women, which was something not common at those <laughs> times. So why being so normative when it comes to music, when that is not seen on the other art forms? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> I think there is, there is probably some difficulty because the, well, to start with, the instruments could not be the same. I mean, you could not put, unless you change something in the story, you could not put, put electrical guitars in, uh, yeah, but in... you could put drums, <laughs> air drums. Drums you could, yeah. <laughs> sure. You can have percussion, <laughs> you could. Yeah. Might, um, no offense to the punk movement, but there's a lot of vivacity <laughs> in the, the music, so you could have that type of rhythm. Yeah, but, well, I, I, I really don't know. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm uh, uh, semi-ignorant in musical culture, so... No, I, I, uh, I don't know. I think, uh, uh, if you permit, I think, João, the question is always the same. There are a, a, a level of legitimation in terms of um, cultural and artistic and scientific legitimation and symbolic legitimation of steampunk and not uh, legitimation or, or reputation in terms of punk rock of course, and that marks these type of things. Uh, 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 and that marks the, uh, um, even, uh, um, that is more evident in a society like Portugal, little, little country, uh, uh, with a lot of elitism in terms of cultural uh, aspects and artistic, artistic fruition and things like that. And uh, uh, I think that the worlds are super, very separate. Just, uh, just now, uh, in, in, the, in the second decade of this millennium, uh, the, the things are more mixed more mixed, okay, in terms of cinema, in terms of um, uh, publications, things like that. But we have, gen in general, not only in the, in the scientific fiction or, but in general, we have an artistic system very hierarchic. You understand with uh, high, high cultural, median culture, and uh, lower culture, and this is a, 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 in in these days today, this marks a lot of things. Uh, there are a lot of resistance in a lot of mean uh, a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, fields including the university, uh, the academic field, in studying uh, things like uh, punk, heavy, uh, heavy metal, uh, electronic music, uh, electronic dance music, not electronic experimental music, uh, fashion, um, things like that, because it's, it's minor arts, you understand? And I think that we need to challenge that. We start to challenge that, okay? Because today, the hybridism of our societies and the hybridism of our productions and the tendency of hybridism is very important. For instance, um, if, you, if, if you speak about the worst tours of Porto, ah, oh, wow, interesting, it's something new. 
different and people go, but, but it takes time. It takes time to have audience. It takes time to have this mix. Uh, it takes time to have uh, this type of me me mix of things. And I think the problem is that one. Okay. Um, I thank you for the answers for both. And I thank you for the, this, the presentations and the talk and the ideas. And uh, we would have much more to talk, but sadly um, we are on our time. I have to terminate the session for the others. I thank you so much. And I hope to have other opportunities to thank continue you. to talk sure. about this team and others. Thank you to and, you um, and João for this experience. <laughs> thank you both. Okay, and see you next time. I will um, end the session now. Okay, okay. thank you, thank, thank you. you. See you later.